Good evening. Is this working? Good evening. I feel a bit like Trevor Noah on The Daily Show. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for coming out. It's great to see uh, such a great group here. Really appreciate that. So as, as you're aware, this is a night to look at what we can start doing for climate action. My wife, who can't be here tonight, says, now don't tell people they haven't been doing anything, because people on Denman are aware of the climate emergency, the climate crisis that we face. And I know all of you have been doing a lot of things to minimize your carbon footprint and who knows what else. Uh, but as I'm sure you're all aware, we can do more. And what is going to be the best approach? So this is the first event that hopefully will bring us together. So uh, my motto is, together we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Together more than just individuals. Uh, speaker, yes. Yes. So the climate emergency does need an action. I think we're all aware that we're facing the climate emergency. Um, little Greta Thunberg, I understand that's how she says her name, uh, who's come over by a um, boat from Sweden and was in Congress today, the U.S. Congress, pretty impressive, um, says in Europe, they don't argue if it, there's climate change. It's a fact there, whereas in North America, we're still debating it somehow. But we do face a climate emergency, and we do need to act. Let's go with the next slide. So I'd like to start. Uh, by just acknowledging that we're on unceded territory of First Nations, largely Comox and the Pentlatch who preceded them, and to remember that, that we're here on their traditional territory. And uh, acknowledge, too, that First Nations people are often the frontline people when it comes to climate change, because it affects them in, in great ways also like to acknowledge and thank uh, the uh, transition group who have uh, helped pay for uh, our speaker tonight and the hall rental. So we're here uh, thanks to them as well. And uh, thank you for your donations, which hopefully will uh, help to start building our kitty so we can do some things. Next. Next slide. Thanks. So stories, I just wanted to uh, share a couple of quick stories with you um, because we relate often to stories uh, better than facts. So I've just put up a couple there. Um, so first we're going to do the clay quat, the next uh, uh, slide. And I think we've got a picture there. I'm not sure if any of you might be in that picture. Uh, many Denmanites were involved in the protests of the Clayquat Sound and uh, fighting uh, against the logging that was going on there in conjunction with First Nations people, of course. Uh, this was started way back in 1980 or so, I believe. Uh, some of you that were uh, intricately involved would know this much better than I do. Uh, but it culminated uh, in, I think, about 1993. Forgive me if I've got the date wrong. Uh, uh, but it seemed to me that what really made a difference in the final kind of stand uh, was that it wasn't just a few diehard protesters, but everybody was coming out. Grandmothers, grandfathers, kids, all sorts of people. There were, what, over 900 that were arrested uh, during that time, but it succeeded in stopping the logging that was going on at that time. And then, of course, the negotiations took place after that. Uh, but it was a significant effort on everyone's part, I think, at that point, that made the success uh, of what it was. Uh, another story that I doubt many of you were involved in, but uh, I became familiar with uh, fairly recently, uh, which would be on the next slide, uh, was the Guayanas uh, Preserve in uh, 
in the Haida Gwaii. Uh, and there was quite a battle that was going on there for a considerable length of time as well. Um, and that's where I got the idea of a climate action train because part of the protest uh, and raising awareness uh, involved a train that traveled all the way across the country to draw attention to the um, wanting to create the preserve of the Haida Gwaii and uh, the uh, title that uh, the Haida Gwaii had for that area. And uh, as I read about it, the, the train that started, it actually um, was, I forget the original person's idea, but any of you that are birders will be very proud because the Canadian Nature Federation played a key role in, uh, in this train that went across the country and drew awareness to what was going on in Haida Gwaii. Uh, I think his name was Greg Shee, who was uh, one of the key players there. And um, they got involved with this train. Uh, there were two, two individuals, actually, that rode the train all the way across, but they got people coming on at various stops. And they started very unceremoniously uh, in Newfoundland, probably much like Terry Fox was when he did his, uh, his run across the country. And uh, it slowly built up steam and more and more people. They rolled into Toronto and, and elders that had been arrested in Haida Gwaii came out. And they had a big uh, meeting in a church in Toronto. And uh, the press got hold of this and were taking pictures and uh, it really made the government and uh, the police look pretty bad that they arrested these elders carrying their Bibles just because they were protesting for their land. Uh, so that train continued on across uh, Canada and arrived in Vancouver. And if we get the next slide, uh, there's a picture there. There were about 2,000 people there waiting for, for uh, the trains to arrive. Uh, and then they paraded on and, and people just kept joining them as they went down to BC Place. And uh, it really raised the awareness and led to some of the success that they were able to have in, in creating that uh, preserve land in Haida Gwaii. So it seems that when lots of people get involved, things can actually happen. So those were two very specific uh, protests that happened. And now we're facing climate change. And it's not going to be one simple sort of train trip or protest that's going to change things. It's a much bigger uh, thing that we have to deal with. But that's where I got the idea of the climate action train and hopefully we'll all get on board and away we go uh, on Denman and you can see our little train that's at the back there. Um, I don't know if any of you were in that picture. but uh, uh, Next slide. So it's all aboard the Denman Island uh, climate action train and uh, we've got a special message from uh, the fellow who authored um, Blue Planet and uh, Planet Earth. So if we could somehow play that, uh, Chris, that clip of David Attenborough. Standing here in the English countryside, it may not seem obvious, but we're facing a man-made disaster on a global scale. It's going to get much worse. It may sound frightening, 
But the scientific evidence is that if we have not taken dramatic action within the next decade, we could face irreversible damage to the natural world and the collapse of our societies. There are thousands of scientists around the world in almost every single country working to understand what will happen in the future if we don't act, we don't do more. They predict that if we carry on as we are now, where CO2 continues to increase, we would hit one and a half degrees global warming by between 2040 and 2050. We're on course to go through 1.5 degrees <coughs> in just a few decades time, and the world will differ slightly as to exactly when. And not long after that, we're on the trajectory to go through two degrees. It really becomes difficult to see at such levels of warming how we're going to maintain our agriculture such that the population of the world can actually feed itself. We ensure if you have access to clean, safe drinking water will become much more difficult. Developing countries that are the front line of the battle. Those parts of the globe which will suffer the most and the soonest are not those parts of the globe which have actually loaded all those carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in the first instance. But you have to understand this is also a crisis for the world. The fact is that if the poor are suffering today, then the rich will also suffer tomorrow. We're running out of time, but there is still hope. It's actually not that complicated. We need to shift our energy system away from fossil fuels that produce greenhouse gases and, and towards renewable energies that don't. We still have time to turn everything around, to, to pull the emergency brake and to take action. But that short period of time isn't going to be lost long. There's a message for all of us in the voices of these young people. It is after all their generation who will inherit this dangerous legacy. We now stand at a unique point in our planet's history. One where we must all share responsibility, both for our present well-being and for the future of life on Earth. So it looks bleak, but there is a message of hope. And I'm very pleased to be able to, able to welcome our speaker this evening, who is a man that I think really can bring hope to us and uh, help direct us along a path uh, that will make a difference. So let's welcome tonight Guy Doncey. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. I'm just going to have a technical minute while Mike and I get our mics all lined up and operating. Can I get a thumbs up from Mike? All good? Hey, wow, all good. So um, thanks for inviting me up here to try and guide you through this process. And um, I tend to, I often get very excited and I talk very fast, so I ask my spirit guides to help me speak with the David Attenborough. <laughs> Slow and calm and steady, because it's my nature to rush away like that train on steroids, right? So I'm going to turn around this way a bit. So we start off, and when I came over on the ferry this afternoon, a beautiful sunny afternoon, like, where's the evidence of harm in our world? And we all love comfort. So our, our default mechanism is to switch back to comfort at the first opportunity. And frankly, we live in the most comfortable part of the world, in the most comfortable part of civilization. We've all got it really good up here, apart from those who are struggling with the housing prices and rents. So why is our world in such a mess? And... Why, what is it with these storm clouds that are gathering that, that when we look at them in detail, keep on rolling the slides, all this waving is going to click on by. <laughs> it should go forward. It, this is meant to be a nice smooth operation as the storm clouds gather. Just, there we go. Oh, there. Okay, so what's happening here is the, the lettering has not come through. The, this transition from one slide system to another. It says extremist politics, housing crisis, debt crisis, um, financial crisis, and then coming, rolling along, in the, the colors have gotten wrong here. They were all in bright yellow before. It's going to go on to inequality crisis, debt crisis, 
keep rolling, keep rolling. The climate crisis is about to emerge at the top of the clouds. I don't know why it's so slow to move. The food and farming crisis, yep. Keep rolling. You just keep your finger on the down button and move them along. <laughs> climate crisis, and we have a parallel ecological crisis coming up. And we also have a crisis of purpose in our civilization. So these, sli these slides move quite quickly. OK, m next. Is there a, yeah. So what's really causing all this mess? Um, I spent 20 years in the climate trenches working on climate issues. I wrote two major books on climate solutions. Then I took three years off to write my novel, Journey to the Future, as a way of showing, look how amazing the future can be uh, if, we, you know, if we really do all this stuff. And then I spent the last three years writing a book redefining our economy and, and what's going wrong with our economy and how the economy works. It's the biggest piece of work I've done in my life. I have read 260 books on economics and economic history in the last three years to understand. And I've come to the conclusion there are four fundamental causes to all of our problems. The first one is probably going to come in black on black. <laughs> um, ecological ignorance. It's just as simple as that. We don't understand how this stuff works. We didn't know there was an ozone layer there until the plane spotted the hole in it. Most people haven't a clue how the atmosphere works. We don't know how the marine systems work. We don't know how the, the antibiotics work in our own guts. We're just ignorant about this stuff. And next slide. The solution to this really is that Ecology 101 has to be taught in every school. It has to become a mandatory course for entry into every university. It has to be mandatory for every cabinet minister. We have cabinet ministers who can't explain the carbon cycle. And we wonder why we're in the mess. So, our simple ecological ignorance is no one to blame, it's just ignorance and we've got to overcome it. No civilized planet can operate if it doesn't understand its own ecological operating system. The second um, fundamental cause, next slide, is our ancient impulse to dominate. Going back to our, our primate ancestry when the impulse to dominate and be the alpha male was always in competition with the impulse not to be dominated because no one likes being told what to do. You know, junior chimps don't like being told what to do. But that impulse and the power games that come up, that, that, that set it up, we can see the whole of history as a struggle between the impulse to dominate and the impulse not to be dominated, which can only happen when you cooperate. Because one, if you've got one strong dominator and one weaker, the, the stronger will take out the younger, the weaker. If you've got 10 people cooperating against the dominator, you can stop bullying, you can stop all sorts of bad things. Democracy is the single most powerful anti-bullying device there is because it means kings and warlords and those people get pushed out. But, and also part of this um, is understanding that there's no such things as economic laws, there's no such thing as capitalism as a system. There are human behaviors, the fundamental core of everything. We express them in capitalism. So capitalism is not an economic system. It's a hu system of human self-interested values expressed through capital in the economy. So we don't need to change the system. We need to change ourselves and our values, the way we operate. Next slide. The third fundamental cause is, yeah, that's the impulse to dominate. <laughs> and it's never going to go away. It's written into our genes. It'll be here in 100,000 years' time. But we will hopefully have learned how to handle it. The hunter-gatherers, for, for 300,000 years when we lived as hunter-gatherers, we suppressed the impulse to dominate. We did not allow it out of the cage because people knew where it led to, which is rape and murder. The third fundamental cause is faulty neoclassical economics. 100% of the economics taught in every university in the world, in MBA, every MBA course, is based on completely phony principles established in the 1800s when the economists were trying to pretend they were scientists. In order to pretend they were scientists, they wanted a unit of energy similar to the atom. So they said it's homo economicus is a, a, a man who always behaves selfishly with self-interest. And that principle is then built into all economic models, along with the other assumption that if we all behave in a self-interested way, the market will reach equilibrium, which is, is no evidence for it whatsoever. But those principles are built into all government models, into all the, the principles of how businesses operate, of how banks operate, and we wonder why the world's in a mess. Because any, any other cost, whether it's you know, um, homelessness or whether it's the climate crisis, is simply an externality on the economic models. The shocking thing is it's still being taught in every university. No university would teach neoclassical biology or neoclassical physics or neoclassical... They only teach neoclassical economics because the, the sub-message that comes from it, which is that when you have this perfect human homo economicus and this idea of market equilibrium, the assumption is that government should never therefore intervene because the magic laws of economics will give us perfect harmony. 
and there'll never be a crash or a crisis, there'll never be any problems, the laws of economics will sort it all out. And that's so convenient to the mighty and the powerful and the corporations that that bullshit, which becomes neoliberal economics, you know, still is taught and still used in all the government models. The Nobel Prize winning economist, William Nordhaus, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on the climate crisis just a couple of years ago, premised his models on the value of human life in different parts of the world and said, well, the comfortable level of temperature increase is two degrees for the whole planet because that's what makes the most economic sense. And only recently, when that, and he got the Nobel Prize for such, talking such nonsense because the Nobel Prize in economics is not a prize in economics. It's a prize given by the Bank of Sweden to neoliberal economists under the, draping the Nobel Prize thing around it. It was not a prize set up by Alfred Nobel. And so understanding how faulty neoclassical economics is driving all this stuff. And it's, in Britain, when the best, best climate modeling was put to the Treasury, the Treasury put it into its economic model. So we can't afford to do that. It'll cause too much price inflation or too much unemployment, so it can't be done. Because their models were premised on faulty principles. The fourth simple, rolling along here, so the, that's Homo economicus. The, it's like a robot, only think theoretically, totally rationally self-interested. The fourth big cause is simply that we have lost our sense of civilizational purpose, which we developed during the Enlightenment. This idea of progress will get us out of poverty, will get us out of hunger, will give people you know, sort of a life exactly like the one we have today. And it worked for a couple of hundred years, and now the dominant meme in all of the media is, is dystopia, it's collapse, it's blight, it's, it's all negative, 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 right? Because we don't know where we're going. And that I want to address as we come on. So without a sense of purpose, you can't go anywhere. You, no one ever achieved anything unless you've got a vision of what it is. Every athlete knows that. Um, Bianca Andreescu has been visualizing winning that tennis since she was like eight years old. She even wrote herself a winning check for the same prize amount that she'd get if she won the, 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 the New York Open, right? That's how you visualize success. But if you don't know what success is, you're visualizing it like Bill Reese did in today's copy of the Tie, even so oh, five billion will be extinct. You're, you're going to have that kind of disaster. Next slide. So that's the, the sense of purpose and where are we going? Yes. So that says in black print, GDP equals gross depletion of the planet. I renamed, I rebranded <laughs> it because whenever we increase our GDP, we are depleting the planet. So just think that thought to, to, to reprogram your brain. Next one. So we're talking about you know, uh, the climate crisis premised around the nature of the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is incredibly thin, vulnerable thing. So to make it easy for you, I, gotta, I do this for high schools. How to understand the climate crisis in 10 easy steps. Number one, number one, <laughs> keep rolling with the slides. Yeah, you have to keep rolling, this, 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 these move fast. Oh, it's in black print again, I have to remember what it says. Number one is the, the Earth has a very, very thin atmosphere, it's 30 kilometers high. So if you think of how far is Courtney from here, 20 kilometers? Yeah, yeah. so just, if you go to Merville, horizontally, think of driving that far upwards, you're out of, outside the atmosphere. It's very, very thin, and all of our pollution lives in this atmosphere. That's number one. Number two, um, there are three, the, the two basic molecules that matter in the environment, in the atmosphere. It's carbon and water vapor. They're the ones that trap heat in the atmosphere. Without them, they, without those, those molecules, we would freeze at night and, and roast in the daytime. We need a, a greenhouse. We need those um, greenhouse gases. Number three, oh, this is funny without the, the, the are. when there's very low water vapor and very low carbon dioxide, Earth enters an ice age. Number, next, move on. And so this is, the, move along here, this is what the ice age looks like. Um, when we had the last ice age here 12,000 years ago, or 25,000 years, there was two kilometers of ice above our heads where we are here today. That's just how, how much there is, right? When it melted, it all poured down the Fraser Valley and created the, well, what we got. So this shows you the, over 700,000 years, how carbon dioxide is the blue curve and the temperature in red track each other very closely. So there you've got an ice age with very low carbon dioxide and temperature. And we've got another ice age coming up 200,000 years ago there. Another on, another ice age. And then we get down to the last ice age, which began to wind up around 12,000 years ago. 
Then we go over the last 10,000 years, the temperature increased and started stabilizing. And then just in the last, um, last 150 years, that's the carbon dioxide level. Yes, that's, it's that far out of whack, caused by burning fossil fuels and rapid deforestation. Next. So step number four is when there's too much carbon dioxide, earth warms, the ice melts, and the sea levels rise. And step number five is the fossil fuels that we use to power our world are ancient solar energy. So the, the, you know, over 200 million years ago, the sun shines. shines next, next slide, move it along here. And it shines on ancient forests, and they fall into swamps, and they, you know, and they, they basically create fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, different, different geolo geological rendings. We drill them up, and we put them in our cars. So whenever you fuel your car up, that material is 200 million years old. It's ancient, ancient solar energy that, that gathered over millions of years, which we're burning in, in 200 years, all of it, burning it all up. Hence the crisis. We're looking along here. Step number... Yep, keep rolling. Um, so coal, coal is an ancient so form of solar energy, just to understand what, it, what it's made from. Alberta's tar sands are ancient solar energy. And when we burn the fossil fuels, we release their ancient carbon into the atmosphere. It's very simple science. There's no debate around it whatsoever. And the atmospheres, they trap the heat. This is street lights at night around the world. 85% of all that lighting is from burning fossil fuels all around the planet. Next. Um, step number seven is when forests burn, their carbon escapes into the atmosphere. And furthermore, when we destroy forests and clear cut them, we release their carbon into the atmosphere from the soil in particular. Step number eight is the livestock industry globally, particularly eating meat, is causing 15% of global warming, meat and dairy. Um, mainly from the big, big chunk of that is the loss of the rainforest in order to grow feed for cattle. So yes, we have to think about what we're eating. Um, step number nine, all the extra carbon and the other greenhouse gases are trapping heat and causing global warming. And there's no debate around this in the science. Earth carbon dioxide levels are highest they've been in 15 million years. And so we have a, you know, an emergency right now, a global 911. That, over the last 4,000 years, shows the average temperature, just to show you the sort of pace at what's happening here. And that shows the same th similar thing over 700,000 years, 800,000 years. That's the carbon dioxide level. And just that dramatically sudden increase. You know, I've been working on climate change for 25 years, and when I started understanding how dire this was, I get that awful sinking feeling in the belly. And my take is, if you haven't, until you've had that sinking feeling in your belly, like, holy shit, we're in trouble here, you haven't understood the climate crisis. It is that serious. So this is, um, shows the industrial emissions from industrial societies have started leveling off because we're now getting control of things, shifting from coal to gas and then into renewables. The rest of the world, mainly China, India, Indonesia, um, South America, are still increasing dramatically. Um, this shows, again, the increase in temperatures in the 1880s. Um, just the, how, that's how we're getting up towards 1.5 degree temperature increase. This shows that um, the richest 10% of people on the planet are responsible for almost half of the total lifestyle consumption emissions. So we have a much bigger burden of responsibility. I don't believe there's any historical issue of, of, of justice because some nation was going to be the first to discover fossil fuels and everyone benefited from it. Without fossil fuels, we wouldn't have had science, we wouldn't have had engineering, we wouldn't have had phenomenal breakthroughs in healthcare, we wouldn't have had cell phones, we wouldn't have all that stuff. We needed fossil fuels to build that sort of launch ramp now we can let go of them because we have renewables to replace fossil fuels. We couldn't make solar panels in the 1800s. We couldn't have electric cars. We did actually around 1910, but they weren't as efficient as gasoline cars. Um, so the debate is over. You know, the facts are in. The evidence is clear. So we have a big crisis on our hands here. Um, this is in British Columbia. We have forest fires. We have a dramatic loss of the Arctic sea ice. We also have the Antarctic sea ice, the Antarctic ice now melting as well. This is Japan's flood just last year. It's huge and sudden. What happens is as the atmosphere warms, you get more moisture taken up from the oceans, and what goes up must come down. So there's more precipitation, and it comes in big sudden bursts. 
Because in between the weather and climate, there's the jet stream. And the jet stream has been getting stuck. It'll stay in one place for 10 days at a time and just dump rain or dump doubt, dump drought on people. And no one really quite understands yet that relationship between climate and the jet stream. And so we have also um, flooding that's um, it's from sea level rise. So this is Vancouver today. The, the, the reason it's a delta is when the ice ages ended, all that two kilometers of ice drained down the valleys and it washed all over. And all the soil in the lower mainland is wonderful you know, rock dust from up in the Rockies. That's a zero meter sea level rise. This next one is a two meter sea level rise. And the next one is a five meter sea level rise. Yes. And it gets worse after that. We're heading for three degrees at the moment. And the last time the world was three degrees warmer, the sea level was 25 meters higher. That's five meters, right? It's not going to happen this century. But if this thing gets out of control, the sea level will be 25 meters higher. Because the ice melts. Simple as that. And, and thermal heat, the ocean expands just its volume, but as the, the thermal molecules get warmer and the ice in the Greenland, Antarctic, Arctic melt. Denman Island's pretty safe. You can go to a map, map and there's not much damage happening to Denman. On Vancouver Island, it's, it's Duncan, all the, the Couch and Valley estuary. That's all gets flooded and wiped out. We're also, because of this and other factors, heading for, you know, we're in the, already in the sixth extinction of species. Um, dramatically dangerous stuff here. So one million species are threatened with extinction. We've had a loss of 50% of wild animals on Earth since 1970 alone. And now 96% of all mammals are either livestock or humans on the planet. Biologists have a thing called the shifting baseline syndrome, which is that a term that when you grow up thinking that all fish are this big, that's normal. If you grow up thinking they're all this big, that's normal. So we grow up assuming that an annual salmon catch might be 100,000, not knowing that it used to be 2 million. And we think that's normal. And so we baseline, if we baseline the normality of, of, of extinction, then we, see, we don't get alarmed by it. That's the dilemma. We've normalized neoclassical economics, so we think it's normal. It's actually very, very bizarre. And the future generations say, well, that was weird what they did then. Next. And so this is um, Hurricane Dorian, just from two weeks ago, and the impact it had on the um, Bahamas just totally devastated. The power of, hurricanes have always happened, but the, the, the increased water temperature means they're that much stronger. So 300 kilometers an hour wind um, hit this area. And just when it comes down to the personal factor of what it means, that was your home, that was your community, that was everything. And on top of that, would you rebuild in the Bahamas? It's all gonna be drowned anyway. So what do you do with people, their home is gone. So there's very, this deep human tragedy in here. And they, you know, the dangerous data are all this around, there's some black print in there I can't read, but it's just basically saying the power of fossil fuels, you know, to, to do all this. Um, since 2000, the world has doubled, just in the last 18 years, we've doubled our coal-fired power capacity to around 2,000 gigawatts. And a further 230 gigawatts is still being built, and another 336 planned. People are still planning to build coal mines and pipelines and LNG plants. That's what's just, you know, that's, sorry, this is just on coal alone. So the message is way, it's so, we're so far from really understanding what, how serious this crisis is. And so we have a choice, you know, of dystopia or utopia. There's no middle ground anymore. We just hang on and think the business as usual. Business as usual will bring us dystopia. And for anyone, you know, I'm now 70, so I've got another 30 years to go. I ain't going to witness all of this. But there's, there's, for 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 15-year-olds, it's a whole lifetime of chaos coming up unless we really get a handle on this thing and start turning it round. So it's a choice of which road we take. And we absolutely have to make that choice. It's an ethical choice similar to the choice whether we end the slave trade or not, you know, in the um, early 1800s. It becomes that deeper an issue. It becomes fundamentally, fundamentally immoral to not make the change. Next. So yeah, this planet needs you to give a shit. <laughs> and so the, the youngsters have really been getting, getting on board with this one. And Greta Thunberg is, I've learned today her name is pronounced Greta Thunberg. 
not Thunberg. The Swedes pronounce it that way. She, that's how it, she introduced herself today in the US Congress. They're saying, our house is on fire. If your house is on fire, you want to panic. You need to do something pretty quickly to all this stuff. And they're saying, you've got 10 years to act. Like, what's the plan? Who's doing something on this? Who's going to make stuff happen? And again, to come to what Demlin can do in a minute. So I got a bit of footage. Um, let's, let's go on to Greta's... Um, I got her, her speech to the World Economic Forum right now. Just a four-minute piece. Let her speak for herself. Yes, so, oh, there we go. 
The school. The, yeah, it's YouTube for you. <laughs> um, you can do the next one. Yeah. By the way, if you want that, if you want to remember where that video was, it's, I, I created a tiny, a tiny URL, just greeter slash thum. So adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to give them hope. We d I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to fear the feel, feel the fear I feel every day, and then I want you to act as if your house is on fire, because it is. Earth has a severe case of carbonitis. And our younger generation is, is feeling it at a very deep level, eco-anxiety, just sleeplessness, trouble, worried feelings. They're picking up on it. Interestingly, people felt a similar thing in the air before World War I. They could say there's something wrong here. They, they knew something was coming. They didn't know what it was. So these are the protests. The big one is this coming Friday. Um, I hope you, when you go home, if you have children, do everything you can to encourage them to take part in it on Friday. Um, there are protests happening all over the world this, this coming Friday. Um, the adults for them in Britain this spring called the Extinction Rebellion, they took it a whole stage further. They planned for a whole year, and they had like 3,000 people getting, getting um, risking arrest, blocking the traffic. They work with the police. They're rigorously nonviolent. They absolutely stay away from anything that is going to sort of trigger the, the knee-jerk response, or they're just violent and troublemakers. Um, next. So yeah, this is the kind of process that's beginning to sort of sweep the earth. It has to be bigger, it has to be bigger. So this is where we need to go. We need to find our way to this, an economy in harmony with nature. This is a, a two-hour slideshow about the new economy, which I'm not going to give tonight. <laughs> and basically what we're heading towards, what we're looking for here is um, so yeah, I, I, just last week I, I put together a document on comparing six of the different Green New Deals. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Jay Inslee, US Congress, US Green Party, and a new political party in Europe called DM25. And I, over a 20-page spreadsheet, analyzed all their policies. And the good news is that they're all saying this decade is a decade of rapid mobilization. They're all having goals for 2030, zero electricity from coal, all cars electric and stuff like that. And there's a lot of other stuff tucked in there around affordable housing, around you know, eliminating debt, around the, you know, getting rid of inequality. So it's not, we, it's not as if we don't know what to do. All the best ideas are really out there. Elizabeth May's new platform for the Green Party released this week has exactly the same kind of material in it. I'm going to include them in it next week. There wasn't enough to do it until last week. So we know what the solutions are. What we lack is the political will to do it. And there's a big piece also missing that's not included in any of this, which I'm going to come to tonight. I also put together a piece on, you know, on my blog, which is the practicalutopian.ca, on how we cope with climate and ecological emergencies and what we can do ourselves. So um, this requires us really to find a synthesis of what's happening deep in our souls and our hearts with you know, the way we think about the world and the way we act. We need to listen to what our inner self is saying and then do two things. We need to understand the urgency and visualize the beauty of where we can be, where we want our world to be. Because as I said earlier, we, every single thing that's achieved becomes because of a positive vision. So in our meditations, hold that image of a world in harmony with nature. And um, so it's about change. It's about change on many different levels. It's personal change, but also at the household level. Community level change, like an island like Denman. We need change um, in the educational system so that what we're learning in schools and the way we're learning in colleges and universities changes. We need change in, in, our, in our culture so it becomes normal to do the recycling, to have solar panels, to have an electric vehicle, to walk, to cycle, all that sort of stuff. It becomes normal and not strange. We need political change with the, with the parties committed to this stuff getting voted into power. We need institutional change, clearly, in, you know, in our universities and our government offices and stuff like that, because otherwise they have resistance and it just blocks everything. We need economic change in the way corporations operate. We need financial change in the way we invest our money, in the way the world money is invested. And we need um, global change with global treaties around this stuff so we all work together as a planet. And finally, we need Story change. So the story of what we are on the earth and where we're going, that needs to change. We're not, so instead of saying the story is we're all going to get rich, we'll all have a picket, white picket fence around us, or we're all going to collapse in dystopia, those are non-functional stories. We need a story that we're heading for a new ecological civilization. 
That to me is the best simple phrasing what I believe is the next thing we're going to, is going to happen on the planet. It's where we need to be. And so that's you know, one artist's vision of what it can look like if we take the right path and, and step away from dystopia. So think of it as a major historical transition. We had all, you've had these transitions before from hunter-gathering to agriculture, agricultural industry, industry to ecology. It's happened before. We are the ones who have to make it happen now. Something in all my learning around history and, and, and economics is there are no laws of history, there are no laws of economics. There's nothing that happens anywhere in the world that doesn't happen at the human level because of human agency. Some individual chooses to make it happen. And so that's how the future changes. If we choose to make it happen, it happens. If we choose to sit back in comfort, we're in danger zone because we're trusting someone else to make it happen for us. And so then we're sort of entering this possibility that you know, maybe Condemn an Island become one of the nurturing seedbeds for this new ecological civilization. So why do I focus on Denman? So if I'm looking around the whole planet for the most favorably inclined places to start this particular thing I want to propose to you, first of all, you want to choose countries that have a government that at least on paper is behind, understands the climate crisis and is behind it. So although they're compromised, the liberals federally, and the New Democrats with the Greens provincially are behind action on climate. The Liberals are compromised by the pipelines, the New Democrats are compromised by the, by, by the liquidified natural gas, but they know that they need to act on this. They're not doing a trump on us. Then you need to choose, um, having chosen, that limits it down to a number of countries. Then you want to choose countries that already don't use fossil fuels to generate electricity. There's a small number of countries that are already generating electricity by renewable means. We are among them. All our electricity right now is 100% renewable in British Columbia. So we only have four challenges instead of five. Normally it'd be electricity from fossil fuels, transportation, buildings, farming food, and forests. We've only, been, we've only got to tackle four of them. So we don't need, frankly, to bother putting solar panels on the roofs because they'll just displace wind energy. In 10 years' time, when this thing's really rolling and we need new electricity, then it's all out for solar. So on a selfish perspective, solar's a very good investment to make today because it'll save you a lot of money. Your average kilowatt hour will cost you 6.25 cents a kilowatt hour over 30 years, whereas in 30 years' time, it'll be 40 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's a good financial investment, but it doesn't do anything to tackle the climate crisis in British Columbia because our electricity is already all solar. It's already wind or hydro. Next. And so can Denman become, this is the question, can Denman become 100% climate and nature friendly by 2025, within five years? The global, the scientists are saying the whole planet needs to be 50% reduction in emissions by 2030 and, and carbon neutral by zero carbon, zero net carbon by 2050. This phrase zero uh, net carbon or carbon neutral, is a, you need to unrack that, unpack that. There are two huge climate goals we have to achieve, not one. The first is getting our emissions down to zero. But all those emissions are still up there in the atmosphere. It used to have 500 gigatons of carbon, now it's got 900. As long as those 900 tons are still up there, we're going to have climate crisis. So we've got to draw them out. We've got to suck them back to Earth. And the, the best ways of doing that are by organic farming, which stores carbon in the soil, ecologically sustainable forest management, which stores carbon in the forests and the forest soil, and, and different ways of managing kelp and species in the oceans. There are mechanical means being proposed of machines that can suck the carbon out, but they use energy themselves, and some of them assume they can be self-financed by selling the carbon dioxide back as a fuel, to, but it gets released back into the atmosphere. So when people say carbon neutral, what they mean is we'll get 90% of the way by reducing our emissions and the other 10% by somehow storing carbon back into the earth. But that's stealing from gold too, because gold too has got to get 100% of emissions back to earth. You know, some one group I know is called it climate restoration to the level of stability it was before we started the industrial age. And all of the means of doing it, tree planting, forestry, organic farming, they're all good for all of us. They're good for nature. They're, it's a, they solve the ecological crisis at the same time. And so... So we're down to the countries that, that, are, that have got a sympathetic government, supportive government, that are on renewable energy already. The next level of choice you want is a community that's self-defined. 
that knows who they are. So I'm talking to Bichosan about the same thing. And so all the Gulf Islands qualify. Like, we, you know you're an island. You're not just a suburb of Langley or some vague sitting in a city somewhere. And the final criteria, the, two, the last two criteria, is that it's the, if we're choosing the most likely, the, the, the communities with the easiest task on the whole planet, relatively prosperous, a lot of PhDs, demon, tick, 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 and finally, high level of community self-organization. 40 non-profits for a community of, non, of, of 1,000 people. <laughs> that is probably the most self-organized community on the frigging planet, you guys. <laughs> and I know you all sit on the boards of three non-profits and stuff like that, but that is how self-organization works. That is a fundamental principle of evolution, that you self-organize. Government itself is a self-organizing thing, but we tend, when it becomes distant, we hand over and we expect bureaucrats to do it for us. The reality is that our, the Islands Trust and the, the Comox Regional District have got very few legal tools in the arsenal that can speed the climate revolution. They have planning controls, a, a bit of zoning. They haven't got the tools needed to do it. We have the tools ourselves right here without that stuff. Next slide. So, and the reason, uh, you know, put, you know that, you know, I want something I wanted to say first. Um, yeah, that, that goal of 50% of reduction by 2030 is for the entire planet. So we know that developing nations are still building coal plants. So in the developed world, we really should be looking at 80, 90% by 2030, which is a huge stretch. And then you want leadership within that. So if you wait to do leadership until 2030 and you get to 2030, oh, look what we did. You say, well, it's too late. Leadership has to come first by definition so that people can say, wow, well, look what they're doing. Then you learn from it all. So, and on, on top of that, the existing models that say we need to get 50% global reduction by 2030 don't account for the fact that we have disguised hope global warming through air pollution. Air pollution keeps us cooler than we would otherwise be. When we clean up, we're going to get an extra little surge of, air, of global warming because the, the air is no longer full of fossil fuel pollution. Next. So this one here. This is, now, go back to this one. If we can now pass around the sign-up sheets. They're, they're behind you on the table, right? This is a sign-up sheet with six choices. And number one says, you, you tick the box, I'd we will work to reduce our household's climate and ecological impact as a family. Choice number two is, I'd like to find a climate buddy so we can help each other, touch base once a month, see how we're going and to reduce our climate impact. Number three is, I'd like to receive the support needed to invite my friends around to a climate dinner, Let's sort of you know, get together in the kitchen and talk about this stuff. So a little bit of training, a little bit of you know, how, what's the best way to, to present this stuff. Number four is a stretch one. I'd like to receive a training in how to invite my neighbors to a climate potluck. The idea here is if 100% if of the people on Denman are going to do this, you need one volunteer for every sort of 25 households who knock on the doors and invite people to come to a kitchen table gathering. Knowing in advance that, because in the data out here, 72% so 70, of people in this part of Vancouver Island accept that climate change is caused by humans, 30% don't. So you're going to knock on the doors of people and say, well, that's a load of bullshit, oh, blah, 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 blah. They're climate deniers. And you need, well, we've got five years. You can just ignore them to begin with. We'll work with those who are sympathetic and on board to start with. But there's some learning to do with neighbors. So, you know, people have that, some people get, they're really, oh, I know all about climate change. It's caused by contrails, chemtrails. They're the cause of climate change. Chemtrails are the problem. All your, so you've got to understand the stuff you'll come up with on the doorstep. But the, the idea is that we reach to everyone. Everyone on the island gets engaged in this. During World War II, there were, so many volunteers on the home front. In 1940, there were 1.5 million members of the Home Guard in Britain volunteering to help people knocking on doors. Here's how to build a bomb shelter. Here's how to grow an allotment. Here's how to do this. Because we took responsibility for our immediate neighbors and worked together to get to know them. And you probably have a higher ratio of knowing each otherness <laughs> on Denman than, say, they do in you know, the suburbs of Vancouver. So number five is I like to work with others to apply, to apply political pressure for faster climate action and lobbying and stuff yeah. like that. And number six, I'd be willing to join the DERA Climate Action Committee, which is the, going to be the central head office for sort of encouraging all this stuff to move along. Next slide. So do sign up when that comes around. So the other, on your chairs, you found this piece of paper, which is a, basically it's a personal planning chart for households. 
And I'm going to go through this not one by one because there's too much of it. So this is, if you're meeting neighbours, you could show them this sheet and you could discuss it. So in this first one, it's around, first of all, call a family meeting so, you know, to discuss this list. Then look at transportation. Can I, you've, got, you've got five years to achieve this. So can I shift to more cycling, buy an electric bike, carpool, blah, blah, blah. So the big one in there is um, buy an electric car. And so ideally, at the end of the five years, there will be no gasoline arriving on Denman Island because no one would need it. It'd all be electric. But you've got five years to achieve this. Next slide here. And the price of electric vehicles is falling steadily year by year. Um, you can buy a second-hand Nissan Leaf right now at Motorize in Victoria for 20000 um, Factor in the, the, the sale value of your present vehicle. Factor in the fact that the, the cost to drive 1,000 kilometers in an electric car is under $10. So you're saving between $1,500 and $2,000 a year on gas. The cost to service a new electric vehicle is, my Kia Soul is $60 a year fixed price. You're not taking the car in for something to service and you think it's $200 and you come up with an $800 bill, which happens to all of us with the regular car. So you've got those savings. Factor in all, factor those savings into the fact that anyone who owns a house can get a free a line of credit and borrow whatever money you want. See, if need be, you can borrow a couple of thousand to top it up on the sale of your car to switch to the electric car and, you know, and repay the, that through your savings on the gasoline. And then factor in the third thing. If you think, well, I need a car for longer distance trips. So my, our electric car's got a 215 kilometer range. The new ones coming out next year are all 395 to 400 kilometers, which is more than anyone should drive anyway without a, couple of, without a break. But say you want to go on a road trip. And there's going to be still some vehicles around during this five-year period before the range is higher. You just ask a neighbor who's got a car, you know, got a whatever it is, do you want to take my electric vehicle for a week and I'll take your car? They're going to say, sure I will. You just do a little internal car swap among yourselves when you need a car for longer distance. Next. So this is Carolyn and myself with our, our Kia Soul. That we got, we got $16,000 discount for this by scrapping an old, 8,000 for scrapping an old vehicle. And then we got um, 5,000 from the federal discount, the provincial discount. Now you get 8,000 federal and provincial and 8,000 if you scrap an old vehicle as well. Um, then this is the falling price of electric vehicle batteries. This is the reason why electric vehicles are falling in price and why within two or three years they will cost the same as a regular conventional car. By 2024, 2025, they will, they will all cost the same. They'll be in the, and any, hands up, who's driven an electric car in this room? Okay. We all know they're way cooler than going back to a gasoline car after being an electric car. It feels, oh my God, this is primitive. This is the engine noise. The, the, it's just primitive compared to an electric car with regenerative braking. Next. And there's going to be electric pickup trucks. They're, they're on the order books right now. They will be arriving. And electric pickup trucks have electric tool recharging built into the truck. So if you're a handyman out on the site, you've got your, your tools there right with you. Um, so then we look at our homes. Obvious things like LED light bulbs, efficient appliances. The big one is upgrade for better home insulation, better windows, reduce heat, le heat leaks, and remove your oil or gas heater. So you're basically switching to a heat pump plus super efficient buildings. So we've done the switch at home to a heat pump. We took out the gas heater. We have a heat pump instead. They, you know, you, there are discounts available on heat, on heat pumps and rebates. The people on, let me get this right, Gabriola, set up a special nonprofit, and they buy heat pumps in bulk, and they distribute them around the island with their local installation. And they, they're getting a level of heat pump uptake that's like 50 times higher than the salespeople are discovering in the open market because they took it on as a nonprofit function for the island. And you can go to Gabriola Energy to find out about that. And then um, I put down solar PV because it's, it's, it's an $8,000 cost for a four kilowatt roof system because it's a good thing to do in the long term. It's long term planning for when we'll need all the electricity. Next. So then also then, oh, this is the rebates. You can go to better clean, clean BC Better Homes the, where you can find out the rebates for retrofitting a home for insulation, for uh, getting to someone to advise you on it, for finding rebates, for building a new home, stuff like that. And then we have financial. Switch to a climate-friendly bank and climate-friendly investments. Because if you're with one of the big five banks, you are part of their investment in the fossil fuel infrastructure. Next slide here. Um, this one, this slide came out just today, showing there are, these are the 32 men who head up the world's biggest banks that are financing fossil fuels. 
They're the individuals who make the decisions to invest billions of dollars in fossil fuels. And we zoom in on North America. Next slide. There we have Scotiabank, TD, RBC, Bank of Montreal, and CIBC. So those banks are enabling climate destruction. When you change to Van City or any credit union, um, you're, you're no longer doing that. And the same with your investments. You can go to RIA Canada, Responsible Investment Association, ask to speak to, a, you know, the, to an environmentally investment consultant and find out how to switch your whole portfolio so you're no longer investing your own pensioner stuff in fossil fuels. Today, or was it yesterday, the whole University of California pension fund with $80 billion said we're divesting our entire portfolio over the next two years to rid themselves of fossil fuels. So there's progress happening up in the levels of trillions now. Next. So then we come to business. There are how many, you know, you've probably got 50 or so businesses on the island. They can become, join the Vancouver Island Green Business Collective, where they're jointly certifying themselves and beginning to track their emissions and drive them down and becoming a green business. They can also become a certified benefit corporation, which are the best in the world, where their whole purpose of being a business is changed from I must make profit to I must meet a community or an environmental purpose as well as making profit. So you're no longer trading one for the other. And so in, by, within five years, every single business on the island could become a benefit corporation and a part of the Vancouver Island Green Business Collective, set up by you know, friends in Victoria. And for workers, if you're working in a business, you can set up a time to talk to your employer about these changes, get some material, print out some stuff, and sit down. Ideally, get two or three of you together to say, you know, what about? Can we plan this as a change over the next year? Next slide. So then we have um, your forest, farm, and garden. There's Mr. Kennedy, somewhere here. <laughs> um, place a conservation covenant on your farm. Adopt the eco-forestry approach to timber management. Um, plant 10 trees. Safeguard your home against wildfire. All this kind of stuff that is already, a lot of it's happening already, but we really need to have a goal that every single farm on the island and every single garden is managed organically. We can't ever get the insects to recover if there's pesticides poisoning them and killing them. So that's a transition which I guess is probably 75% underway on the island already, I don't know. Certainly for farming and gardening, not for forestry, I don't know. The, the forestry is a big problem because the forest puts on value every year and someone dies. The children live in Toronto. They're approached by a forest company, so if you cut the timber down, I'll give you good money for it. And all of our forest is in danger because as it, and just at the stage when it's beginning to put on old growth value, it's now 80 years old probably since the last you know, round of clear cutting came through, beginning to put on value. And if we leave it and let it be and use ecoforestry principles to do appropriate thinning, keeping the really big trees with the best seeds, you know, keeping the, the wildlife trees, the forest will re restore itself to old growth principles. And with old growth forest, you get the cooling of the climate. Temperature is three or four degrees cooler in the forest than on the open farmlands. So all these things matter for your local climate on the island. And with ecoforestry, you can still harvest timber. And if you've got permission to build two or three houses on your land, you can at least cluster them together so, you know, so you minimize the damage you do to the forest. Next. And then we have um, shopping. Buying local, buying certified organic products, eating less meat and dairy, trying a vegetarian diet, eliminating non-sustainable palm oil products. Whenever you eat, all the, 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 the soaps and shampoos and stuff used using palm oil are destroying the, in, the, in, the rainforest in Indonesia and in Liberia and wiping the orangutans out of existence. So just, there's a website there you can go to to find out you know, how you can get products that are not going to destroy you know, the rainforest. The same goes for paper. The, the, very, the paper your sheet is on is made from the waste from sugar, sugar plants. You can buy you know, sugar paper in, in the stationery stores. What's the main one in Victoria? I forgot. They've got an office in Duncan as well. Hmm? Monks. Monks, yes. Monks sell the... the, the it's, more than, it's more than recycled. It's completely tree-free. made from sugar, right? And the same for personal care products, for, for paper, for, for, for chocolate, stuff like that, green, house, green household cleaning products, etc. And then on waste, we need to aim at zero waste. We need to set a goal that we're having nothing going into the landfill in the end. So using the free store, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And learning this clever thing, we haven't got the habit yet. When you go traveling and you go to a restaurant, you want to take food home, oh my God, I forgot my, you've got another styrofoam container. <laughs> Just learn to take a little travel kit so that you can have your own materials. You don't have to endlessly get plastic, this, that, and the other. Next slide here. So then, so the final one is community engagement. So to join DERA's Climate Action Committee, 
to invite your, these are options over the five years when you want to do it, to invite your friends to a climate action dinner table gathering, to choose a climate or nature focus and then start a group around it. So it could be, we'll take on electric vehicles, we'll start promote them, or, or we'll do electric bikes, or we'll do electric safe, safe bikeways, or we'll do um, saving your own seeds. So that you're an educational focus. And some of these already exist. But there's, there's so much scope for leadership in this field, because we need leadership around the, actual, the core functioning of this thing. Um, leadership for greater political activism and lobbying, for electric bikes, for ride sharing, for electric vehicles, for home retrofits, it's quite a technical area for the food and farming transition, for zero waste, forest protection, for the transition out of destructive banking and investments. So you have a champion for that who's putting out stories and putting information about so people know about this stuff and, and you know, for Denman Island businesses to go green. So you, you start with the two or three businesses already green and say, get them together and can we get all the businesses? So it's huge scope for leadership. As in World War II, when the people, you know, you either joined up here in the army, but back on the home front, there was so much scope for leadership. People said, I'll do this, I'll do that. Everyone stepped up to do something. So there were no, very few bystanders. Next stage. And then, so a campaign to help the best climate aware candidate win the next election, and then join the beach cleanup, which is happening right now. So politics matters in all this. We do need to get the best climate aware candidates elected. Um, so that's something, whether it's Green or NDP or Farmers Party, whatever it might be, I don't know, but it's a local decision. I'm personally totally behind the Green Party at the moment, but that's the thing. So yes, in World War II, stay, but go, so go back to this slide here. In Britain in World War II, victory would not have been possible without the millions who volunteered to help the Red Cross, the YMCA, Women's Voluntary Service, and John's Ambulance Brigade, Oxfam, and the Home Guard, which by June 1940 had 1 1.5 million volunteers. That's just eight months after war was declared. You know, so that's the kind of level of engagement we need. And um, finally, the end. Leave a legacy for nature and climate in your will. Think about it in advance, write it in, and then have a plan a beautiful green burial <laughs> right here on Denver. We're already pioneering green burial. Next. So I've forgotten what comes next now. Discussion time, yes. <laughs> That's what's next. I got a few wrap-up slides at the end of this, but so, ah, big breath. Spend a minute and talk to your immediate neighbor. Chatter, chatter, chatter. Then we'll have questions. Okay. The teacher's hand up system. <laughs> you don't know the teacher's hand up system? I must, I must teach you the teacher's hand up system. When you, if you want silence, one person puts the hand up, then everyone else slowly copies it, then everyone shuts up. <laughs> How many of you believe that we need to try and do something like this, of trying to get the whole of Denman climate and nature friendly within five years? Fantastic. I got the same response in Machosin. How many of you would be willing to take a personal role in, in helping to make this happen? Fantastic. That's, that's really good to hear. So let's have um, questions, thoughts from anyone. And if you haven't got a loud voice, I'll repeat the question. Yes, at the back. This is a very practical question. What do you think the value of, the, of a gas-powered car will be when you go to do a trade-in? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very smart question. The Sunni, she, her question is, what do I think the value of a gas car will be when you go to the trade-in? Well, it'll stay steady for a year or two, and then it'll collapse. Do it sooner. The sooner you do it, you're, I mean, obviously, the more you wait, the lower the price will fall, but... I hadn't ever thought about that before, that there's going to be no market for all those vehicles. Sorry, someone's saying? Well, let's try it. That's the dilemma. When you sell it, someone else is driving it. But Yeah, it's one of those, we're in the transition, it's one of those things. Another question, thoughts from anyone? Yes. Consumer lobbying. Well, there was a general one around political lobbying, so that would fit into that if you wanted to target something. Well, I, I see there are a few members of Plastic Free Denman here tonight. Excellent. And, um, you know, we're facing an uphill challenge yeah. of um, packaging yes. of produce of anything we buy. I, I, I find it crazy myself. Like, how did when I've got all the soft plastics which you collect to go to the recycle, how do they... Yeah, <laughs> Luckily, I mean, the federal government has committed to eliminate all single-use plastic by 2021. It, it's, so, well, it's 
So is it the details are weak? They're talking about straws. And yeah. Even not talking about yeah. plastic wrapped cauliflower. Yeah, and plastic yeah, but luckily, how many stores do you have on Denman? It's an easier task, right? But then a lot of people take the car over to... By the way, if you, how many of you go to Costco? Some. Don't... This has nothing to do with the talk tonight, but we had a huge block sewage problem recently where I live. Don't buy Costco toilet paper. It doesn't biodegrade. Just as a word of advice for rural people living on septics. But yes, consumer lobbying. Other thoughts or questions from anyone? Yes. The sulfur hexafluoride. Yes, that's right. Uh, which it, it, it emits a gas, which is supposedly to twenty thousand times worse than CO2. It's thirty-six thousand five hundred times worse than CO2. Yes, it is not just wind farms; it's all electric. So the the, the take-home message is that we we have to take action. We have to move forward. But for goodness' sake, get the science right. It's it's not. No, 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 it's not to do with wind farms. It's all electrical systems. It's not just the wind turbines. It's everything. Society has been sold on the fact that all we have to do is convert to huge wind farms, and it turns out that they are giving off this gas, which is 20,000 times worse okay. than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. So get the science right. No. So the issue is not around wind turbines. It's around all the whole electrical industry. And it's, it's, it, it, is 30, it does trap 36,000 times more times heat than CO2, but it's a very, 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 very minor gas in the, in the balance of things. It might be 0.2% of the global problem. So we have to get things in proportion. So if you start door knocking at your neighbors, you'll have some people, oh, these wind turbines, they kill, they kill birds. Yes, it's true. Wind turbines do kill birds. But for every one bird that's killed, there's 1,000 cats, that, you know, 1,000 birds are killed by cats and 5,000 are killed by high-rise buildings. I don't hear anyone campaigning to say we should eliminate cats because they kill birds. So it's really a political thing masquerading as an excuse. So just understanding the data on that sort of stuff. So the stuff around wind turbines and SF6, it's a, he's, he's partially right, but the bigger picture is different. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Please do, yes. Yes. And I didn't see any part of that that really engages youth. Um, I know the Denman Conservancy and the community school, are, we are now going into our second year of our youth environmental yes. program. And I invite the community to contact DCA. We have a website with an info in there. If you'd like to help us with this project this yeah. year. Yeah, that's fantastic. My reference to that was very beginning with the, fir the four major causes of our problems on the planet is ecological ignorance is number one. So we should make Ecology 101 as fundamental as, as reading and writing. But then I think it needs to be on the list of how people commit to work with you. Right. I, I was... Okay, that's a good point to add to the list. Yeah, I see what you, see what you mean. Yeah, but what I'm, what I'm hoping for is that if three universities in Canada, say so UBC, UVic, and you know, SFU would say, starting in two years' time, we won't accept any student who's not got a course in one, Ecology 101. The parents would then force the schools to produce the course, and it would happen, it would get done. The curriculum review has just happened. It took 10 years, so to go through the curriculum review process is another 10 years, like, way too late. We've got an urgent crisis here. We all have to understand the basic science of how this stuff works. And if your schools, if the school here, which is only um, elementary, right? Yeah. And the relevant secondary school in Courtney could pioneer that so that every child leaving the school has done a course in Ecology 101, that would send a wave across the whole of Canada as a pioneering thing to do. Ideally, the whole school district, but you know, sometimes just starting one school is the way to do it. It's just interesting. Um, addendum to that is one of the things we're looking at, and this is all graphed at the moment because we're just beginning our yeah. planning for this year, is in the Philippines, for kids to graduate from high school, they have to plant a tree. So yeah. we want to institute that. That's a great thing, too. It, it, yes. Yeah, and understand the ecology of the soil and the tree while in doing it. Why? Another, why why yes, why? 
other thoughts, comments, disagreements. <laughs> I didn't know you were such a shy crowd here, I don't know. <laughs> yes. No, I know, Fabi, you're not shy, no. I just wanted to announce that there will be a climate action potluck this Friday. It'll be a vegan potluck in the back hall. And we're now entering our 30th year of raising awareness around vegan tax policy. And we're inviting everybody to come on over to see a show on conspiracy, which looks at the impact of biodiversity on the planet. All are welcome. You don't have to be a vegetarian. It's a great place to pick up new recipe ideas and to gather with friends. What time? Great. When I wrote my first book on climate change in the year 2000, I was sharing a platform with a well-known climate scientist, and I said that um, at the time it was like 20% of the cause of global warming was meat and dairy. And he huffed and puffed, oh, that's total nonsense, that's total nonsense, that's not true whatsoever. Two years later, he said, hmm, you were right about that. Um, globally, it's 15% of the whole cause of... It's, it's, more, it's the same as all the world's transport. Every, you know, our, our use of, of meat and, and dairy is the same as all the world's transportation in terms of its impact on the climate. It's that profound. And so that personal change. I've personally been vegetarian but not vegan for 50 years. I'm still standing here. I'm alive, right? So it's evidence that you, you don't suffer. In fact, you benefit health-wise if you, sweat, if you eat much less meat. Other thoughts or questions? Can you stand up? I can't hear you. I live in Yellow Point now. I was in Victoria 25 years, yes. You solve it by getting on a bicycle. It's really easy. Yeah, but what are all those commuters doing? What are what? How do you change the behavior of all those commuters in 10 years? You build safe, separated bike lanes, and then they're used. But Copenhagen started its transition actually in 1970 because they were just being overrun with cars. And they said, we're going to change all our transportation planning from a car focus to a cycling and walking focus. Now I believe 43% of all trips to school and work are done by bicycle. In Holland, overall for the whole country, it's 33% um, of all trips done by bike. And someone will say, oh, Holland's flat. Yes, but when you have an electric bike... You're at the bottom of the hill, you switch on the electric drive, and you sail up that hill without a single muscle pain. So electric bikes and electric trikes for people getting older. The key is safe, separated bike lanes. So you do not feel endangered by the speeding drunk behind you. When you and Victoria is doing exactly that right now. Build it, Victoria, and it's getting huge opposition from angry motorists who don't understand that every cyclist has one less car on the road. Hello, cyclists are doing motorists a favor. So having you know, Denman so that there are, it's, it's safe to cycle on every road is an important you know, step forward. Yeah. Yes? Um, until people get their electric bikes, I'd like to recommend Well, that's a... Here. Okay, so on, on Penda, South Penda, they were looking at getting a village bus, and they couldn't afford it, so they set up a thing called Car Stop, and they've got set locations, and you stand in that location, people know that you want to ride. And it's used very widely. And on an island, you've got a very high level of trust among each other because you're going to meet each other again. If someone treats you badly, you're going to know it, right? So, so to normalize hitchhiking by a, a rideshare spots where you can stand, you know, it's, it's easily done. And Penda can show you the, any legal things they had to go through, whatever. They, they've done it on Penda already. So it's a really good way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes? I have a question about uh, permafrost. Yes. No, they don't, because the, 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 that's the, 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 the melting permafrost is one of those big unknowns, and it releases methane. There's locked up methane in there. That's one of the things that Greta Thunberg keeps on commenting. With that goal of 50% reduction, it doesn't account for the melting permafrost. We don't know how rapidly it's going to happen. It's one of those feedback factors. Yes? Sorry, another what? Excellent. Go away, Ron. I haven't finished yet. <laughs> I, want to, I, want to do my, I want to do my wrap up slides. Let's go back to the. Um, it's clearly the message from the, the doctor in the house, right? <laughs> so, the, the, so, coming back from the, the dead, remember our last slide was the, the den of funerals? Coming, coming back from the spiral of light. Next one. 
this is my final closing piece. The, the, we are part of this amazing, incredible evolutionary process that's 14 billion years old. Every atom in our body was created either in the Big Bang or in the supernova explosion. Just phenomenal. And that all those atoms self-organized to make us. And so they've created this, this phenomenal world that we live in with so many species that share so much with us. And share, you know, the owl probably shares about 70% of our genes. Um, the chimp shares 99% of our genes. And now this is what we're doing to our planet. So this is the transition. We've got a really huge change. That, you know, we can change this world. We've done it before. We need to do it again. It's, it's an essential need to do this. And so it's about finding that place in your being. When you're in meditation, find that central glowing place and, and visualize we can do this. We can transform our whole planet into something beautiful the way nature wants it to be. Next slide. And throughout existence, having a positive intention of the future outcome is the only way that things have been achieved. Every sports person knows that. Everyone in business knows that. The non-profit world is very poor at knowing that because we tend to complain, complain, complain instead of being positive and making things happen. And never doubt that a small group of thought more committed people on Denman Island can change the world. <laughs> Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So I'm picturing that you know, if you come to a group decision together, we're going to do this, you would announce it in advance. Like when Kennedy said, we're going to land on the moon in 19, by the end of the 60s, no one in NASA knew how to do it. They said, we're going to make it happen. And you discover as you go along. There are important learnings to be made by the first pioneers in this. Like, what's the best way to approach people you don't know? What's the best way to deal with the climate denier? What's the best way to deal with someone who believes it's chemtrails causing the whole thing? We need, and what's, what's the best way to have a climate dinner table meeting that's just so, so much fun that people want to go back to the next one? What's the way to sort of listen with compassion to someone who's got deep eco-anxiety? These are things we can learn and then share with other communities. Next. And so we just, you dream of this thing, you plan it, and you do it. And you sort of, that's the, with the new ecological civilization as the goal of where we're going. So in World War II, Vera Lynn sang a song to, to motivate the troops, not about killing Nazis, but about the vision of life after the war. And basically, the next slide, if you, you all know the tune. It's, um, these are the White Cliffs of Dover, which is the first thing you meet when you go to invade Britain. <laughs> um, she sang... There'll be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover. Tomorrow, just you wait and see. There'll be love and laughter and peace ever after. Tomorrow, when the world is free. Well, that was very good. Now you can join me with my version of it, right? There'll be solar rooftops and lush organic gardens Tomorrow, just you wait and see. There'll be bike bells ringing and nature singing. Tomorrow, when the world is green. You can't read it. The next one, I haven't finished yet. Go on. The forests will grow so deep, the planet will bloom again. The farmers will heal the earth on their own precious land again. There'll be solar rooftops and lush organic gardens. Tomorrow, just you wait and see. There'll be bike bells ringing and nature singing. Tomorrow, when the world is green. No. <laughs> and now, from the youth perspective, we have a song by... Ellen McKechnie and Kalina Young from the Eco Defenders Program here on, on Denmark. <laughs> oh, that's my that's my final slide. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm just gonna. No, that one. Wrong one. There it is. It's, that's not the right song. Everyday miracles. Yep. That's it, yeah, that's the one, I think. Sound. 
No, not that sound. want to see it again, you can look uh, Google Eco Defenders, and you'll see that and all the other videos that were made this summer on Denman by 12 to 15 year old teenagers, camp led by Hillary Pryor. Hillary? EcoDefenders.ca. Make sure you put the .ca, otherwise it may take you somewhere else. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful program they have and beautiful things they've produced. Um, this is just the start. Um, hopefully the sign-up sheets have made their way around. We have a climate action committee under the auspices of DIRA. It's official, yes. <laughs> and that will allow us to move things forward in, in significant ways, but of course it all depends on us. I um, really want to thank Guy for coming to uh, give us his, all his expertise, his readings, his understanding, his enthusiasm, and uh, for just being here and uh, helping us get engaged in this journey, journey together, because together we can.
make a difference. And I think he's probably going to want to know how we're doing. Um, so I'm not sure when we'll get you back. I'm happy to come up here as a coach every so often and just help nourish you along. If you uh, want us to be as uh, Des Kennedy, also known as Donald Trump, says, make <laughs> Denman great again, yes. <laughs> we have to do that. Um, so for those of you particularly who have uh, put check uh, off uh, number six, which I think is be part of the Climate Action Committee, uh, we'll be in touch shortly and uh, we'll get going on uh, what's going to happen. And Howard? Well, just ask you the rest. I've got three of the lists. Three of the lists. Are the lists still going around? If you haven't, we'll have them up at the front. Please come up and sign. Um, and uh, great. So uh, be safe and take care. Thank you.